finely mixed cocktail. Dow's love of nature may be what contributes to enjoy his enjoyment as a photographer, old cameras, and a lover of photographing ordinary things. When he served as dean, it is said he would walk the halls, glasses perched not on his nose, not even on his head, but on his fort. Now, I practice doing it, and I can't, so would you please? Thank you. He would walk the halls, glasses perched as exhibited, <laughs> asking in his gentle and inquisitive way, is any deaning necessary today? <laughs> as for his teaching, <clears throat> one of the tasks of the dean is to receive anonymous comments on the teaching of faculty members. Dow is always excellent at this task. He's respectful and fosters a cooperative level of respect from all his students. He's truly an amazing professor. I enjoyed the wealth of knowledge that Dow always brings to his courses. He's the best professor, offering experience in joyful and entertaining ways. I hang on to every word he says. <laughs> Dr. Edgerton really knows how to facilitate learning and participation. This was my favorite CTS course so far. Dow is without a doubt the most gracious, prophetic, learned, seeking, amazing professor I've ever had the privilege to study with. This is one of the best classes I've ever taken, and it is due mostly to the wonderful and supportive environment that is fostered in the classroom. It was an amazing experience. Dow is fantastic. It's a good thing you don't share those, share those with us while we're actually engaged in, in the vocation, right? We would become impossible. More impossible. More impossible. Ordained by the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church, Ted Jennings completed his bachelor's degree at Duke University before com <laughs> What? I have photos, so be careful. <laughs> before completing his BD and PhD at Emory, he taught at Emory for two years before coming to Chicago Theological Seminary as assistant professor in 1972. We kept him here for six years before he went back to Emory to serve as associate research professor of systematic theology for six years. Then he went under the auspices of the Board of Global Ministries to the of the United Methodist Church to serve as acting dean and professor of theology at Seminario Metodista de Mexico for three years. We finally lured him back to CTS in 1991. He is a prolific scholar. Some of his books include, this is just some of them, mm -hmm. Introduction to Theology and Invitation to Reflection on the Christi Christian Mythos Beyond Theism, A Grammar of God Language, The Liturgy of Liberation, The Confessions and Forgiveness of Sins, The Man, uh, Forgiveness of Sins, The Man Jesus Loved, Homoerotic Narratives from the New Testament, Reading Derrida, Thinking Paul, on, on Justice, Plato or Paul, The Origin of Western Homophobia, Outlaw Justice, The Messianic Politics of Paul, and An Ethic of Queer Sex, Principles and Improvisations. A number of these are translated into Korean and or Spanish. And there is so much to say about Ted. Yeah. Ooh, there yeah. is. Tell the truth. The question is, what can I say in this place? <laughs> We're in a chapel. <laughs> in the last few years, Ted has taken up running, particularly by the lake. He's completed several races and even a half marathon as well as a triathlon. His signature for these races? 
Upon completion, he posts a picture of himself on Facebook. Doing what? Smoking a cigarette, of course. Long an advocate for international students, Ted and Rana often welcome, hi Rana, we hope you get well soon. Rana's not here because she's getting well. Ted and Rana often welcome members of the CTS community into their home. Some call Ted a workhorse when it comes to his work. He is out front, he was out front in developing online courses for CTS. He frequently, if not always, teaches an overload. He holds the record for evaluating student papers and turning in his grades, all while wearing a black leather vest. And when he's had enough, you'll find him with tequila in hand on his way to Mexico or on his way to Taiwan or the Philippines or Korea where he will sing karaoke and be a vocal advocate for LGBT persons. And for his teaching, This course helped me more in ministry and preaching than perhaps any other. I gained a strong working knowledge of each of the Gospels, and I'm able to equip congregants with new tools for understanding the Gospels. I hope Dr. Jennings continues to teach forever. <laughs> Apparently true. You did. You did. <laughs> So far. So far. Dr. Jennings is particularly gifted in managing diversity and difference with diplomacy and measured temperance. I applaud his methods for dealing with touchy subjects and the intellectual prowess that makes it all part of the learning journey. This instructor is a model for effective online teaching. If any other CTS faculty are hesitant about teaching online, have them talk to Ted Jennings. This wasn't really a subject that I personally enjoy. <laughs> Yet, Dr. Jennings helped me appreciate why this subject truly does matter to me. Good sense of humor, historical knowledge, unique interpretations, Ted Jennings is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> She's been like that a great help since I became president. <laughs> Susan Thistlethwaite earned her B.A. from Smith College, her M.Div. and Ph.D. from Duke University. She began her teaching at CTS in 1983. During this time, she served for five years as the director of the Ph.D. Center. She also served for 10 years as the 11th president of the seminary. She is the author or editor of 12 books, including two different translations of the Bible. Her books include... Lift Every Voice, Constructing Christian Theologies from the Underside, Adam, Eve, and the Genome, Theology and Dialogue with the Human Genome Project, A Just Peace Church, Inter A Just Peace Church Interfaith Just Peacemaking, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Perspectives on the New Paradigm of Peace and War, Dreaming of Eden, American Religion and Politics in a Wired World, Occupy the Bible, What Jesus Really Said and Did About Money and Power, her new book, Women's Bodies as Battlefield, Christian Theologies and the Global War on Women, is forthcoming. Do we have a date? July 12th. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> she is a frequent writer for the Washington Post and the Huffington Post and often serves as a media commentator. Her public service brings national recognition to Chicago Theological Seminary. A strong and effective advocate for women and women in leadership, 
She empowers other women in and out of the academy to claim their agency. During her time as president of CTS, she partnered with then board chair Howard Morgan, right here, and then Don Clark, right here, in trenchant negotiation with the University of Chicago, which resulted <laughs> eventually in our being in this lovely space through the sale of our old building. Also known during her tenure as president, to lead a money dance when donor checks were received. <laughs> Susan loves dogs. I understand that when she was president, one of her dogs, Missy, used to attempt to herd people in or out of her office. That's one dog I would like to have. Mm. <laughs> An advocate for yoga and skiing, Susan frequently encourages her colleagues to attend to their health, but that doesn't stop her from enjoying chocolate. <laughs> she is rumored to get up in the morning, do her yoga, and drink hot chocolate, and then write for three hours, all before 8 a.m. In addition to her academic and public theology writing, she is the author of a mystery novel involving a seminary. <laughs> And as for her teaching, Dr. Thistlethwaite is a skilled and dedicated educator. Susan Thistlethwaite is an outstanding teacher. She's the best I encountered in my four years at CTS. I was energized about this course and found it of tremendous value. Susan is a blessing to the course and has been a blessing to my learning all throughout my time at CTS. Susan is one of the most compassionate people I've ever met. I love her. I hope I get the opportunity to take a class with Dr. Thistlethwaite again. She was so attentive to students and offered helpful feedback. She really listened to us and respected our opinions. Susan Thistlethwaite should lead a seminar on the do's of online courses. An outstanding rock star of a teacher. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Thistlethwaite. I complete my seminary education on a very high note. Oh. You know, I told you earlier that we had um, three board chairs or former board chairs here. We actually have four. John Keller is here and Judy Keller, Friends of Chicago Theological oh, Seminary. One more. I didn't see you, Tom. Please stand up. And Joyce, please. Oh, how wonderful. The five of you actually don't quite make a century, but you're close. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And so, Tom and Joyce, would you please come join your other uh, board chairs on the front? And so you see a century of teaching. Now, just for a brief comment about all three of these. All three of these are huge draws for prospective students. These three set the curricular goals and content that have shaped us for 30 years. And these three were part of a core group of faculty in the good old bad days <laughs> of CTS who pulled a turnaround, fighting fiercely tooth and nail to address deep structural challenges to save the school during a time of financial crisis. 
We know and love many things about these three people. Perhaps the most evident is that each of these three love Chicago Theological yes. Seminary. For that, we are all grateful, and we look forward to hearing from you about the contributions of CTS to theological education. Just a note of interest, when Dow was an MDiv student, he studied with Ted during his first tenure, Ted's first tenure here. With that then, let us turn our panel, which will be moderated by Dr. Bo Myung, turn to our panel, which will be moderated by Dr. Bo Myung So, Associate Professor of Theology and Cultural Criticism. You should know that when Dr. So was a student here, he studied with each of these beloved faculty members. We look forward to hearing from them. If this was any other event, I would have stuck to my role as a moderator, timekeeper, and keep things rolling and moving. But I am not just a simple moderator. Uh, I like to step outside my role as a moderator of this special event because I have to. I have to express a word of gratitude to all three professors whom we are honoring uh, this event, this evening. It is because I am here today, not just as a, as a faculty member, another faculty member of this institution, but also as a student who sat in many, many of their classes uh, many years ago, uh, which I really do remember <laughs> like it was just yesterday. <laughs> and I just could not let this occasion go by without saying a word of public thanks for their role as teachers, mentors, and as friends. In doing so, uh, I am not just representing myself, but countless other, countless number of students over the last four decades who have been taught and shaped by professors Dow Edgerton, Susan Thistlethwaite, and Ted Jennings. Some are here today, some are today in many different parts of the, parts of the country, and some are indeed in many different countries in the world, all with us this evening, joining us in their thoughts, honoring the work of Susan, Dow, and Ted. Let me just speak for myself, sharing just a little of what I learned among all the all many things, which still informs my understanding of theology. They taught me that theology is not just a body of knowledge, but a set of commitments. Mm -hmm. That theology is not just a set of doctrines, but a matter of praxis, an orientation toward praxis. That theology is not just a tradition needing to be mastered, but a way of being based on one's prior commitments. What I'm, while I'm speaking for myself, I am sure there, there's a a lot of people here and other places nodding their heads and agreeing with me. So thanks, Dow, Susan, and Ted. Just because we are honoring their good work for CTS this evening, uh, we do not let them sit back and enjoy themselves <laughs> while people say nice things about them. <laughs> that just would not be the CTS way. <laughs> here at CTS, we let people work <laughs> until the very end. <laughs> and hence, the panel and the title for this evening's event, CTS's Contribution to Theological Education, Past, Present, and the Future. And yes, we do intend to have a future here, one that is as vigorous and as exciting as the CTS they led for the last 40 years. Because we are envisioning a future that is as exciting and as vigorous, we decided to take a step back and ask for the wisdom of these three professors in terms of where we have been and where we are today and where they imagine and hope that we go from here. Here's how tonight's event will go. All three professors will each speak for 15 to 20 minutes. Professor Dow Edgerton will speak first, 
followed by Professor Jennings and Professor Thistlethwaite. And afterwards, there will be some time, 10 minutes, I, I suppose, uh, for an exchange among the three professors because they may not all agree. <laughs> and we shall see. And then uh, Professor Joanne Terrell, Associate Professor of Theology, Ethics, and the Arts, will come forward to give a response to, to what the wisdom imparted to us by the three professors. And if time permits, and I am uh, hoping that we will have some time left uh, for uh, questions from the uh, audience. Mm -hmm. And when that's done, uh, Professor Hunt will come back up here again uh, to give us uh, a closing comments to end uh, tonight's uh, event. Uh, now, will you uh, all uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Dow Edgerton to come forward? <laughs> My angle of view is a personal angle of view. I'm a product. I was nurtured by the seminary as a student. I've been nurtured by the seminary as a faculty member. Um, whatever CTS has contributed to theological education in the past, the present, and the future, it has contributed directly to me, and it's, that's the place from which I'll speak. And you will not be shocked to know that I've, there's a scripture I'm thinking about tonight. <laughs> and it comes from the 50th chapter of the book of Isaiah, and it is this. Morning by morning, God wakens, wakens my ear to hear, to listen as those who are taught. Wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. Morning by morning. God wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. Morning by morning, by morning, by morning, by morning. That, that begins to be a lifetime, doesn't it? That begins to be a lifetime. A lifetime of practices, a lifetime of relationships, a lifetime of, mem of, of memory and hope and the disciplines of those relationships and practices, and the disciplines of memory, the disciplines of hope. I remember in one of my first classes at CTS with Professor Andre Lecoq, who was professor of Prime Testament, <laughs> and sitting in room 133 in the old building, I remember one, one day he, he was standing and he was teaching and he, and he had the Bible open in his hand and he, he, he said the word, 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 W-O-R-D, he said the word word with such intensity and such intention that I was full of wonderment. What is he saying? With such intensity and such intention, what is he, you know, what is he saying? He had in his hand a book no different from the book that was in front of me. And yet he spoke this one syllable so, with so much wonder himself. And I think I have spent a lifetime trying to understand still what Andre was saying on that day. That I, and I think that the first, the first quality of what CTS has contributed to theological education, mine, perhaps yours, is an invitation to this life of study to a life of study, morning by morning by morning by morning, a life of study, of teaching and learning and learning and teaching and teaching through learning and learning through teaching and teaching by learning and learning. And, and you can't tell anymore where the teaching ends and the learning begins and the learning ends and the teaching begins because it's the whole community doing it. In the next few minutes, what I'm going to do, uh, I want to reflect upon, upon that life of study as I have been encountered it here in the past and in the present, and I hope in uh, what is still our life of study in the future. And I'm going to do it with the help of um, one story and three poems, OK? <laughs> one story and three poems. The, the story is actually a fairly recent story, only a couple of years ago. I was, um, was uh, we had a class in uh, worship and preaching through the Christian year. And we were looking at uh, liturgies and 
scriptures for the season of Advent, a season of repentance, as, as is Lent. And I made the mistake of speaking honestly, uh, <clears throat> for which one often pays a price. And I confess that I, I thought that uh, in our curriculum we, we needed an entire course on question of forgiveness. That we needed an entire course on the questions of forgiveness, but that I was afraid to offer such a class. And they said, why? And I said, because questions of forgiveness go inexorably and with an iron determination to whatever is most unfinished and most painful. And I am afraid of that. So I, I confessed this to the class, made the mistake of confessing this to the class. And they said, well, you know what that means, don't you? I said, what? They said, it means you have to. Thank you for sharing, says I. <laughs> a few days later, I was sitting in my office, and I was talking with my, my colleague, uh, Susan, and I told her what had, what had happened in class, and I told her what I had said, and I told her what they had said, and, and she said, well, um, you're, you were right. Of course I knew that. <laughs> She, and then she said, but, but they were right, too. You should do it. But you shouldn't do it alone. I'll do it with you. And so in 60 seconds, telling a story and her hearing and responding, in 60 seconds, she made a commitment to a class and to a subject matter, which I think held some frightening things for her as well. In, in, in a minute, she made that commitment to all the work that that would entail. CTS students who do not accept fear as reason enough to hold back are wonderful teachers. <laughs> are they not? And in that course, many, many of members of that course are, are here tonight, as a matter of fact. In that course, I, I learned what I should have known already, or maybe I relearned what I had forgotten. And that is that it was not up to me to be adequate to everything I'm afraid of. There are colleagues. And it was not, it was not for Susan and me together to be adequate to all the things we might fear, because there would be colleagues in the room too. It would not be only us. There would be other sisters and brothers. There would be a whole room full of people upon whom we could depend and upon whom we did depend. And it was not up to all of us together to be adequate that, to all that might frighten us. Even together, we might not be adequate to what was most painful and most unfinished within us and between us and among us. And I am persuaded that there were days when Holy Spirit came and held us. And that was more than enough. More than enough. But now to the poems. Um, it has, uh, over the 30 some years I've been here, it has often fallen to me on certain occasions to provide the bad poetry that was required. <laughs> uh, not everyone is willing to provide bad poetry, um, but it has all, uh, therefore it has often fallen to me. And, um, uh, it has generally had to be done with uh, apologies to Western literature in general, and sometimes to specific poets, um, uh, who, though they may be dead, still are owed, owed an apology. And um, the, first, the first one of these three actually comes on the occasion of Ted's 60th birthday surprise party. Um, Ted's 60th birthday, birthday surprise party, um, which was a couple years ago. A couple years ago. Uh, just a couple. And l let me assure you, it is difficult to surprise Professor Jennings, uh, in, even with, with a party. But, um, and, the, <coughs> and the, and the, po the, the, the occasion of the poem was a celebration of Ted. But the, the poem isn't about Ted. It's about the life of study. And Ted was one who also initiated me into that life. Uh, the poem, um, this one in particular has, owes apologies to W.B. Yeats, 
William Butler Yeats, and actually begins with several lines from his poem, Sailing to Byzantium, and then it veers off in its own direction. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying, well, that part's not quite right. Unless to study means to love, and love means staying up all night, and night means dancing on and on, and dance means friends, and friends mean light. And if that's the case, well, then it's true. And study is everything we do. The book, the page, the song, the knife, the bread the cup, the kiss, the strife that honors deep the truth of life. And the comment, I would hope that CTS continues to call us all to a life of study and a study of life in which study is not a separated and sometimes thing, but the center of an actual passionate and engaged life mind and body and heart and imagination and critical thinking and compassion and writing and talking and sitting and walking and ordinary heroism. Because the word is not only the word on the page, but it's also the word of the face. And it's the word of the wind and the word of the birds and the word of the street and the word of the woods and the word of the stranger and the friend and the enemy. The life of study is this life of joyful difficulty and difficult joy. What should I do, Paul asks. What should I do then? What should I do? I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the mind also. I will praise God with the spirit. I will praise God with the mind also. First Corinthians. Um, the, second, uh, the second poem is uh, from the same occasion because it's a long evening. <laughs> And um, it, it takes multiple resources of different kinds uh, for, a, for a long evening. And um, this one uh, owes apologies to the prophet Isaiah and also to um, William Blake and also uh, to John Wesley um, and his, uh, his sermon on the general redemption, which actually Ted had introduced me to a, a wonderful sermon on the, on the general redemption. Remember not only the lamb, remember the leopard as well. Not only the calf, but also the bear. The nursing child, yes, but also the asp. The ox, to be sure, but also the lion. None reversed, all redeemed each in its special glory. Remember the general redemption, as our friend reminds us to do. For whatever else heaven is and must be or else be too small for all who belong, there is where we shall be most ourselves and most changed and most astonished that both can be true. comment, I believe that theological education at CTS has taught me that the task of learning and teaching requires paradoxically such a great power of holding on and of letting go, releasing. Perhaps it's why we struggle so in intensely with Questions of race and gender and class and culture and sexuality and person and experience and mind. It is simply so difficult to see and to hear, to think, to speak, to act honestly. It is simply so difficult. And a single lived honesty, a single lived honesty can be so costly that you have to hold it fast. 
but it can only be held fast honestly if it is released again and again to relearn its truth. So freedom of inquiry is not only something we must protect from those who are outside. It's something we must protect within ourselves. Where the spirit of the Lord is, Paul wrote, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the third uh, and final poem uh, was on the occasion of our farewell to uh, a colleague, uh, Laurel Schneider, just uh, not, not too long ago. Uh, apologies here are probably due to uh, William Carlos Williams and, um, and Richard Wilbur. They are the likeliest suspects, at least. Because nothing is guaranteed between the beginning and the end, yet everything is promised beyond what we believe. Because flames breathe air, and air and wood breathes flames, and smoke always rises to escape the fire. Because water seeks its own, falling, flowing, finding, yet springs press up through solid stone. Because rich, dark ground gives birth, pushing forth the life, and life returns to life to heal the ancient earth. Because will be is greater than what was, but is, is all we ever know. Let us recite the mystery. Love has died. Love is risen. Love will come again. And the comment, um, I believe here at CTS, sometimes the learning breaks free from the lesson and sometimes the, um, the power breaks free from the plan. And sometimes the charism breaks free from the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the learning is exactly because of the lesson. And the power comes from the plan. And the charism is pleased to dwell within the curriculum. And both are real possibilities. And either way this happens, or in whatever way it happens, it is a kind of Pentecost in which everyone hears in their own language and speaks, hearing and speaking and teaching and learning and learning and teaching and teaching and learning. And however true these characteristics are, or have been at as characteristics of theological education and the life of study at CTS. I hope that they will be even more true in the time to come. That morning by morning by morning by morning, God will awaken, will awaken our ears to listen as those who are taught. And that's what I want to say. And now Professor Ted Jennings. been asked to say a few words about theological education at CTS. I confess I have been torn about how to respond. I could talk about my deep concern about the future of CTS, a future that sometimes seems to me rather bleak. Sometimes we seem to have no better vision for that future than to increase the number of students while drastically reducing the faculty. 
We rely on more and more students taking on greater indebtedness in order to pay our bills while exploiting the labors of poorly paid adjuncts and graduate students. This seems to me to be a direction that leads not only to financial ruin, but to academic and perhaps ethical bankruptcy as well. But I will not focus tonight <laughs> on my worries about CTS. Rather, I want to focus on my gratitude. For I'm grateful to CTS for the 30 of the 45 years I have so far been blessed to be a teacher of theology. Without the invitation to teach here, I could not have done the work that has been my life's blood. And this invitation was given to me not once but twice, first in 1972 and after several years' absence again in 1991. It is gratitude that has been the fuel, the energy of all my labors here. My first time at CTS brought many blessings. I will name or focus on only two. Shortly after I arrived in the alien north from the warm and sunny south, <laughs> I met a second year student, Ronna Case. We fell in lust and then in love. And she has been the life-giving companion of my days and nights since 1972. Two years later, we consented to our mother's desires that we be legally wed. And that deed was accomplished in the old CTS chapel and in the cloisters where friends came from around the country and even from other parts of the world to join with the girls of the foster home where Rana was working, and the faculty and students of CTS in celebration of love. And playing the guitar at that celebration was Dow Edgerton, still a student at CTS on his way to becoming a lifelong friend. In those days, CTS was blessed by the presence of several students from South Africa. Later folk would say that the list of our South African alums reads like a who's who in the struggle against apartheid. This international connection is the second thing from that time I want to highlight. From them came the invitation to come to South Africa and to join with them in their struggle for justice and dignity for all peoples of that beautiful and troubled land. Ron and I spent several months there. She served as a sort of midwife to the emergent feminist movement there as she had already done at CTS. I lectured at various places at the behest of alums, Jim Cochran, John DeGrucci, and our lives became entwined with so many extraordinary folk like Bears Node, Theo and Helen Kotza, Robert Subukwe, and Steve Biko, who was murdered before I could complete all the assignments with which he entrusted me upon my return. It was at CTS that the U.S. Memorial Service for him was held, and it was CTS that offered me the resources to launch a protest on the part of scores of seminaries around the U.S. against the persecution of the confessing church. This engagement shaped my theological work until now, even indirectly leading us to Mexico since the government of South Africa prohibited my return for many years. When I again received the call from Perry Lefevre to return to CTS in 91, he wondered if I had forgotten how bad the winters were. I was also given the academic freedom to launch a series of courses that would become the Queer Center. And this would in turn allow me to do the work that led to many seminars and several books. To this was joined the openness to my teaching New Testament, thereby fulfilling a dream awakened in my graduate school days when I worked with Hendrik Boers and Ernst Kesemann. Where else but CTS would it have been possible to so blatantly cross disciplinary lines? And this has also offered me the chance to produce books and articles in biblical studies, despite being a philosophical and erstwhile systematic theologian. 
To this was added also the opportunity to work again with many international students. CTS had lost the stream of African students and also a connection to Japan. And Rana and I were determined we would not ignore the astonishing gift of students and friends from Korea and Taiwan and so many other places around the world. She invented and then taught the Global Sensitivity Course while we delighted in playing host to the international students at CTS. Let me jump to the present. We've just returned uh, two weeks ago from seven weeks in Asia. The first several days we were with Rana's Indonesian Muslim family and I was so happy to be able to tell them about the growth of the Jewish Christian Islamic Center at CTS. Mm -hmm. Then we went to the Philippines, Taiwan and Korea. I'd been to these places many times before, been uplifted by the astonishing work being done so, by so many of our alumni. These folk not only greatly enrich the intellectual and corporate life of CTS when they are here, they also greatly extend the effectiveness of our vision, our mission, and commitment across the world. This time was special not only because Rana was able to travel with me, having retired from hospital chaplaincy, but also because in addition to lecturing on things like Paul and Derrida, we were enabled to participate in the struggles and aspirations of persecuted gay, lesbian, and transgendered folk in these countries. First with the impoverished but buoyant young queer folk of Cebu, who embraced us in their love and dance and their gratitude for solidarity and messages of God's all-embracing love. Without Carl Villarmea, our alum, I would not have been involved with the wonderful folk of Bizdok Pride since its very beginning. They call me Lolo, grandfather. <laughs> in Korea, in addition to time with our extraordinary alumni there, I was also able to return to the militant and loving group of young activists called LGBT Solidarity and Human Rights, a group I was introduced to by Bom Young So in 2001 shortly after the movement was born in Korea. Perhaps I should also say it was because of Bum Young that I first visited Korea when he was a CTS International alum in 94, thus beginning a long love affair with Korean people, their culture, their food, and of course, karaoke. <laughs> But I must also mention the time in Taiwan. I had gone there first in 94 to visit alumni, a very impressive group of pastors and theological educators and even a politician, a radical politician. On that occasion, I met with our most recent alumna, Yahweh Yang, who had just returned to Taiwan with a mission to establish the first ever congregation that would welcome and nurture lesbian and gay Christians. Years later, she would despair of the prospects for her prophetic ministry and commit suicide, despite daily exchanges of emails in which I attempted to dissuade her. The morning after we arrived in Taiwan in March, I preached in the church that Yahweh founded. At this place, also called the church with no address, filled to standing room only. I was moved to tears at the fruit of her labors. For in Taiwan, lesbian and gay Christians are under daily assault from the church's homophobia. Here they were hungry for the gospel of God's embrace of the excluded and humiliated. Then and in the three-hour seminar that followed, we were deeply moved not only by their suffering, but also by their resilience, their commitment, their courage. The Rainbow Fellowship, a semi-clandestine network of LGBTQ Christians all over that country, to which our most recent Taiwanese graduate, Wesley Chang, serves as a sort of chaplain, asked us to be with them. 
So we traveled to meet with, encourage these wonderful folk all across the country. At the end, I would preach Easter sermon at Wesley's church. Alice was there. But on Holy Thursday, Alice was also there. We met in the upper room with representatives of the rainbow from north and south, east and west, to recall the passion of the Christ who was rejected, humiliated, condemned by the religious establishment as they are now. And also to recall the passion of love that embraces all who are despised and feel that same love bursting forth among us in the sharing of food and good whiskey, hilarity, and generosity, and even erotic play as they raised money for their friend and our new student from Taiwan, Charing Chen, the first and only openly gay seminarian from Taiwan. What's the point of that rehearsal? To say how grateful I am to CTS for the chance to be involved with so many people in so many places who struggle to embody justice and mercy in the midst of a world of avarice and violence, even in the midst of a church that always sides with respectability and power. You see, for me, it's all about the students and the gifts they bring and they're coming to us, the work they do when they go out from us. CTS has given me this astonishing blessing of being a part of their journey. I focused on international students because they've been so close to my heart these days. But there are so many others who have blessed our corporate life and whose commitment and creativity continues to shower blessing upon me. And now that range of students is even further enhanced by the number of students I know only online or on Facebook. I am so grateful for the ways they continue to challenge me and to encourage me. While this is true of students in all degree programs, it's especially true of our astonishing array of PhD students. Sorry. Since Bum Young challenged me to move outside my comfort zone to read in and, and engage Emmanuel Levinas, a number of doctoral students have pushed me to read and engage so many challenging bodies of knowledge and insight, from Marxist theory and Rosa Luxemburg to psychoanalytic theories and Julia Kristeva, from James Baldwin's novels to representations of the Virgin of Guadalupe, and so much more. Without them, my intellectual life would be greatly impoverished, as would also my company of friends. <coughs> I should also say how grateful I am to CTS for the ways it has embraced my rather odd extended family. Mm -hmm. A particular notice here is the way that after his death, Susan Thistlethwaite led some faculty and trustees to establish the Alberto Castaneda scholarship and lecture, something that remains an integral part of our common life. I do not know whether CTS will continue to attract students of such impressive intellectual gifts and prophetic commitments as those I teach now. I do not know if CTS will be characterized by a faculty of scholarly productivity and of absolute commitment to teaching and to students, or by international commitment and engagement. But this I do know. In each generation, CTS has had to reinvent itself. When we, who are now retiring, came to CTS, it was a CTS reborn from defederation from the University of Chicago, CTS with a wonderfully creative curriculum shaped by the vision of folk like Perry Lefevre, Ross Snyder, Phil Anderson, Vic Obenhaus, 
later joined by André Lecoq. And in the early 90s, it fell to us, now retiring, to try to reinvent a new CTS with a far more diverse faculty and a far clearer set of commitments following upon our mission and vision, to which, of course, was added the constant, unceasing struggle to prevent bankruptcy that seemed always imminent. It now falls to the next generation to think and act more boldly still. Do I say remember that theological education is not a career? It can only be a vocation. That it depends upon tireless commitment to students and to the liberating word of God. That theological education is what happens between and among faculty and students in the various texts we share. Everything else is support or dispensable. So it is imperative to think not of self-preservation and entitlement, but of absolute commitment to the emergence of the next daring and dramatic shaping of theological education. And in this, I wish those of you who remain, Godspeed. I close with the words I used 24 years ago to say what I thought theological education is all about. It remains my vocation, whether here on the Midway or in remote fishing villages in the Philippines and places in between. The Word of God must be released from the imprisoning forms that had made it serve the interests of the powerful and the prosperous so that we may again hear good news for the poor, the despised, the oppressed, the brokenhearted. The work of the reformation of Christian teaching does not belong to the experts but to all who are grasped by the gospel and are called to co-responsibility within the community of faith. In the seminary, I hope, we provide people with the tools for this task in a community of mutual accountability that respects our diversity and witnesses to our unity in the spirit. For the opportunity CTS has provided me to pursue this theological vocation, my first word, my last word must be thank you. And now the third member of, the, of our panel, Professor Susan Thistlethwaite. First, I want to say how touched I am by looking out at these board chairs and that you came. Because, without them and without the dedication of countless trustees, there would be no CTS. You can have great teaching, but if you have no classrooms, no salaries, no students, you're not going to get very far, and you need that dedication and that partnership. So I'd never heard of Chicago Theological Seminary. And I was sitting in my office at Boston University, and the phone rang. I picked it up. Voice on the other end says, we heard you're pretty good. <laughs> and I said, who is this? And he said he was Perry Lefebvre. And they had an opening in theology, and they wanted me to come interview. And I said, okay. Let me talk to my husband, Dick. I got home that night, and I said, I had the weirdest call today. <laughs> and Dick said, you know, and I really, I'm a New Yorker, right? I thought they were going to be butchering hogs on Michigan <laughs> Avenue. I was not <laughs> enthusiastic about this. But Dick said, Chicago's, you know, where I want to go 
that's where the most exciting stuff's happening in transplants. And oh, okay. So I flew out and I interviewed. And in old CTS, this was in room 430, was arranged as a lounge. And I got into a giant fight with Professor Weidig Schrader <laughs> over Karl Marx. This is the truth. I am telling you the truth. And he stood up. So I stood up. <laughs> and for those of you, now, I don't take that. You know, you stand up, I'm going to stand up. And so we finished the interview. I called Dick. He said, how'd it go? <laughs> and I said, not well. Back to Boston University. Phone rings again. This is Perry Lefebvre. We'd like to offer you the job. <laughs> It took me years to ask Perry why they had hired me. And Perry, person of very few words, and Perry said, you know your stuff. <laughs> Besides which, arguing with Whiting was something everybody did. So that wasn't that unusual. But I get to CTS, and there was two constructives, constructive one and constructive two. Several students just blanched, but in fact, there used to be two constructives. And um, Perry had taught this for 20 years, and he wouldn't give me the syllabus. And I had come from Boston University, where people used to notarize their memos because other people sent fake memos in their name. It was the most polarized, most... Um, uh, a really unhealthy sort of place. And I was very suspicious of this. And I persevered, and Perry didn't say anything, so I kept changing it, and I kept changing it, and out of this came Lift Every Voice that I did with Mary Potter Engel. And you know, if you've studied with me, that one of my favorite things is what Mary Potter Engel said. The most liberating question you can ask is who the hell set things up this way? <laughs> and that's what we specialize in in CTS. We ask that question. Later on, I asked Perry, why didn't you ever give me a syllabus? And Perry said, I didn't want to interfere with your freedom. Mm -hmm. And this is... Perry believed in freedom, intellectual freedom, and my colleagues have echoed this. Mm -hmm. I spoke and taught freely at CTS for the very first time. Mm -hmm. For the very first time, including studying at Duke. And to me, constructive theology as it is taught at CTS has been, we don't teach you theology. We teach you to be theologians so that forever after you will ask that question, who the hell set things up this way? And then you'll have an answer. But freedom, Tao said freedom, you know, you have to be free inside as well. So I'm teaching at CTS. I'm standing in 133 one day, young teacher. I'm lecturing on Valerie Saving, Sin for Women, title of the lecture, Feminist Theology. In the back of the classroom, a student, Verda Beach, stands up, and she said, you don't mean me, white girl. It's truth. And I looked at her. And I said to myself, oh, crud. <laughs> I don't. In fact, I said something stronger to myself. I realized I didn't mean her. And so for the next six years, I did nothing but read the writing of African-American women. And I wrote Sex, Race, and God. CDS is the only place I know where it takes you six years and a book to answer a student. <laughs> and that book is dedicated to her, to Verda Beach, 
and to the other African-American women at CTS, including Linda Parrish, the longtime and of blessed memory secretary to the dean. I took the nearly finished manuscript to Linda and I asked her if she would read it and give me any comments. And I went to see her and she handed it back to me and she said, I never knew you people wrote about anything worthwhile. What a damning, damning thing to say about our enterprise. But what a place to be able, for me as a teacher, for Verda and the other students, to come to that moment of conflict and change. And we have to change still. You know it. You know it. And then there was that little excursion into being president. <laughs> and as some of you know, I did not volunteer. I came to believe it was a call. And you know what a call is? It's when you say, I don't want to. <laughs> I really don't want to. And, uh, but Dow said to me, that I regarded the presidency as a bully lectern. And this is the truth. Somebody's going to make the mistake of calling me a religious leader. I'm going to get on that horse and I'm going to ride it as far into the public square as I can. And from opposing the Iraq war to being asked to testify in the hearings of John Roberts to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, 60,000 pages they sent me. I just said, yes, oh sure, I'll do that. And 60,000 pages arrived. I had student volunteers all over the place reading through John Roberts' papers, and I was right about him. I was right about him. I said, in closing, John Roberts, because I used the Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech as the frame for my testimony in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I used the promissory note that the Constitution is a promise. And it's been returned in sufficient funds. Yeah. And John Roberts, said I, said he, interpreting the Constitution was just calling balls and strikes looking over the plate, calling balls and strikes. And I said to him and the other members of the Judiciary Committee, the Constitution swings for the bleachers. Dr. King knew that. And if you're looking down at the plate, you're going to miss it. And he had. alluded to, you know, the struggle to keep food on the table at CTS, the struggle. I was, oh, I thought I could save CTS, solve all our financial problems. And saving was the wrong idea. I came to realize, as did many of us, Howard and I, over how many coffees, Howard, we could swim in the amount of coffee we drank dealing with this, but we had a couple of things going for us. We had the mission, and we had our smarts. And we outwitted a university that has its own business school and its own law school. Right, Don? And we knew, being theologians, that they had hubris. And we played them. <laughs> but what I learned about theological education from being president was that these spaces for freedom, for creativity, are being deliberately destroyed constrained, crushed. And so not only saving CTS, but growing CTS, 
taking our online education into these theological deserts around the country and around the world is an act of resistance because the place to think and act freely is being systematically closed. So then I got a full pardon and returned to teaching. <laughs> and I wrote Occupy the Bible. Now one thing I think we need to do more of at CTS, I wrote Occupy the Bible to take a lot of what we do into local churches and to connect the struggle of people in local churches to the economic vice that is being tightened around the vast majority of people in this country. But it is very uphill. Mostly in white Protestant liberal churches, it is very uphill. Because they are used to thinking of themselves as caring for the disadvantaged, not as the disadvantaged. And that, that's tough. That's tough for people who thought they were the cultural center. But they're not the cultural center. And you say, you know, it's clearer over here on the margins. Come on, you know? You could more act against what is crushing you if you realized that you were in solidarity with other people pushed to the margin. And this is a hurdle. This is a hurdle of race. This is a hurdle of the history of the Protestant center of American exceptionalism. But if we cannot get over that hurdle, there will be, never be a true theology of class. In recent years, I have been very blessed to be volunteering for the Carter Center, which brings together two commitments of my life resisting war, and working against violence against women. And I have realized, as you've gathered from the book title, that the war on women is not a metaphor, it's actually a war. And the way to more deeply understand both the violence against women and the mechanisms of war today have to come together. War is now dirty war. It's dirty war, like the war in Argentina, or like the Congo. It's the disappeared. It's sexual assault, not just by authorities in other countries. Sexual assault by authorities in our country. You know there is a just war theory. But there is a just battering tradition. There is a just rape tradition. And these expose why just war theory is wrong, profoundly wrong. And it is why justifying violence against women is an offense of our time. But you know, you don't ever give up being president. <laughs> That's something I've realized since I've been back to teaching. I can't forget what it takes to make this place go. And I know how hard this job is to be president. And when you pass Alice Hunt in the hall, don't say hello, just say thank you. Because you don't know what she has done most of the night before, all day the following, or most of the previous week. You don't know. These small schools are so difficult to preserve. And we have to throw everything we have at it all the time. These forces that are up against us are no joke. They are global. And they are increasing. Like my colleagues, CTS has fostered a climate of freedom and creativity for me. 
and for the many students I have taught and known, and for my colleagues as well. Perry gave me the freedom to do constructive as I see fit. And I think the appointment of Dr. Christoph Ringer will be the next phase in a yet new and different approach to constructive in theology. When he was speaking, he engaged Aquinas in one of the conversations. And I profoundly disagreed with what he was saying. I did not stand up and yell at him, however. <laughs> but there's some traditions that we just let go. Um, but he engaged Aquinas contextually. And I thought, you're the guy for us. Now, we had wonderful candidates. We were blessed, blessed beyond belief. But because I disagreed with him, but I was so inspired by the way he contextually engaged Aquinas, I have no doubt that the future of teaching theology constructively at CTS will be very exciting. Perry had faith in me. Perry trusted me. Trust was a big word for Perry. Perry trusted me. Because he trusted me, I increasingly trusted myself to take risk. Somewhat similar to the kinds of things Ted said. And it is up to me to invest that same trust in those with whom we are entrusting the future of this institution. Protect it. Grow it. But never protect it at the price of not taking the risks that doing, really doing theology today requires. Thank you. I have just one thing to say. They do not disappoint, <laughs> do they? <laughs> if you do not know Tao, Susan, and Ted, you've seen the quintessential Tao, Susan, and Ted <laughs> that I remember. Provocative, challenging, and inspiring. Thank you. Now we have a few minutes uh, for a conversation amongst you. Uh, you may take back anything that you've <laughs> said uh, up here, or you may add, uh, listening to others, uh, in anything that uh, they inspired you to uh, add beyond you know, what you already said, or you want to you know, engage in one another. So several minutes, uh, just about 10. Uh, uh, go ahead. Oh, that's before uh, Professor Joanne Terrell. Uh, right. uh, well, uncharacter up. uncharacteristically, we're going to be disobedient, Bum Young. And uh, we have just agreed that because collegiality is the hallmark of CTS, we want to hear from Joanne. Okay. So go You're on, next. Joanne. Jump in. Okay, Professor Joanne Terrell yeah. will give a response. <laughs> President Hunt, Dean Stone, Board Chairman, Mr. Norman Williams, and to the other Board Chairs who are here tonight, to the trustees, faculty, and staff colleagues, to the students, friends, and enemies of Chicago <laughs> Theological Seminary. I got that last one from Dow. <laughs> To the honorees, the reverends, doctors, Dow Edgerton, Ted Jennings, 
and Susan Thistlethwaite, and to your families, grace and peace to all of you. And also to you. It's a good thing that I have not cultivated my gifts to be able to roast people well. <laughs> I'm not that funny. But I have some funny stuff on you guys, and you know it. <laughs> like, like the time that Ted actually beat me in a, in a, in a, in a judged karaoke contest. <laughs> no. 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 I could not believe it. <laughs> Cannot be. But it was, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> For this celebration of your pending retirements from your respective teaching ministries, I'm really humbled by this privilege to honor you in these brief remarks concerning your collective legacy and individual legacies to this institution and community, to the faculty as a body within it, and to me personally. The English word honor devolves to us from the Anglo-French honor and Latin honorum of the high middle ages and means glory, renown, and fame earned, dignity, office, and reputation. The first known usages of the concept of honor in Europe reflected the feudal emphases on debt and repayment in economic arrangements and chivalry and gallantry in social relations. And for women, this meant the preservation of chastity as markers of spiritual refinement. And it's a good thing that Ted was not born a woman in the high Middle Ages. <laughs> I've often said that. Uh, I think he agrees. <laughs> All right, okay, so far. Yeah. To modern ears, to honor means simply to show respect and esteem to those to whom they are due. Postmodern deconstructionists might well trace the rise of agrarian capitalism and debt structuring, the ever widening social class divisions between the very few wealthy landholders and the vast majority of peasant laborers the rise of the nation state and the collusion between its work and the presumed work of the church to prescribe civic and social behavior, control women's reproductive rights, and arrogate the right to define and dispense no less than the means of grace to the utility of the Western concept of honor, a powerful little word. Mm. And yet, in its original meaning, honor captures what each of you gives to Chicago Theological Seminary through the glory, renown, and fame you earned through your prodigious, passionate writing, through your efficacious preaching and public addresses, and not least, through your compassionate ministries to the local, regional, national, international and ecumenical church, as well as to the world religious community. Jointly, through the vision, mission, and commitment statement of which you three are the chief architects, you have impelled CTS to be all we can be for the honor of the world. <laughs> and you have inspired all of your colleagues to, be, to bringing all of ourselves to the work. I came to CTS in 1995. In 1999 or thereabouts, I recall going to Detroit to visit for the first time the sanctuary of the Shrine of the Black Madonna, which was a former congregational church which underwent a transformation after the race riots of 1967 where the religious practice is now African orthodoxy. 
I had and have a deep interest in the place. My book, Power in the Blood, first published in 1998, has a section on Albert Cleage, the shrine's founder, and still another extended passage on the Black Madonna herself. I left the sanctuary and went to the bookstore, hoping in my intellectual pride that I might find a copy of my book. <laughs> Instead, the very first book I noticed, because it was prominently displayed, was none other than Theodore Jennings' Beyond Theism, A Grammar of God Language at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. <laughs> I didn't know whether to be outdone or amused, as I often don't know whether to be outdone or amused when it comes to Ted. <laughs> but it is a testament to the very high regard in which our Ted is held as a theologian in marginalized communities, not only in Chicago and Detroit, but in South Africa and Korea and Latin America, whose well-being has been at the heart of every one of his commitments to the poor, the racially oppressed, and the sexually marginalized, and whose absolute right to be free from oppression he has defended these many years. For well, much of my time here, I've kept my office near Dow Edgerton's office to great advantage, to me anyway. <laughs> Dow is for me the non-anxious colleague whose love of art, poetry, and music mm -hmm. inspires me towards a wholeness I might not have pursued had it not been modeled for me in such an excellent way in my early years. He models wholeness in the way in which he honors theological traditions, particularly of John Calvin, without being beholden to every implication thereof. <laughs> I learned deeply from the way his never failing kindness compels him to find a gentle way to speak hard truths. And it is a joy to witness how his pastoral instincts are always spot on, especially when mine fail me. And that's been often in the course of 20 years of teaching. I am grateful for his ministry to this community, serving for eight years as our academic dean. Some of you may recall that he preached at my daughter's baptism. Perhaps you don't know, and I've never thanked him publicly for the fact that he went with me to court when her adoption was finalized. I am beyond grateful for his ministry to my family. Of Chicago Theological Seminary's theologians extraordinaire, I met Susan first, at first on the telephone, and then when she picked me up from the airport as I arrived for interviews. Even though by that time I was ABD and had already read some of her brilliant writings, I knew instinctively that I was in the presence of a truly anointed woman. Her gift of humor is legendary, but so is her gift of compassion. For much of her time here, she also conducted Bible study at Genesis House in Chicago, a place which helps women transitioning from prostitution or survival sex to a safer path and a sounder sense of their self-worth. She drew me into this work, and it was transformative for me. A few years after I arrived, she contemplated becoming president of the seminary and entered the process. I was on the search committee comprised of board members, staff, and faculty, which confirmed her as our choice. For me, two things made it apparent that this was to be no mere fluke or a foregone conclusion, but it would be a divine appointment. First, as part of the committee work, we asked a number of people to speculate on what some of our candidates' presidency would be like. 
when I asked my mentor, Dr. James Cone, the father of black liberation theology, to speculate on Susan's presidency, he told me, let me see if I can get his voice right. <laughs> if I needed somebody to fight for me, I would hope it would be Susan Thistlethwaite. <laughs> I want her on my side. There is no one more fearless, no one more honest, no one more dedicated and able than she is. Secondly, when Susan interviewed with the committee, she told us that you know it's a calling when there's a sacrifice involved. She was speaking not only of her penchant for teaching, but also of her activist commitments. The hermeneutics of sacrifice notwithstanding, I heard in her comment something that I had not heard from the others, the willingness to put her whole self into the fray. This would come to mean the kind of risk-taking and negotiation that led us from a 20th century mentality to a 21st century vitality, from a backward gaze to a forward march, from 58th Street and Woodlawn to 60th and Dorchester, where we are now. It occurs to me, Susan, that you were not fearless, but faithful. And faith risks being wrong, but follows through anyway. This is honor. Susan, Ted, and Dow, as devotees of a greater, more expressive, more inclusive, more joy, peace, and life-giving good, you take the vocation of a theologian seriously, continually searching for and finding the yet more truth and light from scripture, tradition, and ongoing, unfolding human experience. As teachers, preachers, and pundits, you are still holding your lights high. Through your dignity, office and reputation, you have helped to draw not only a luminous cadre of like but not same-minded colleagues to the seminary, but also a precious cache of like but not same-minded students who are themselves excited about searching for, finding, and sharing yet more truth and light with a world struggling for a way forward, struggling for a way forward beyond the crassness of poverty, of perpetual warfare and insipid evil. In fact, humility overtakes me as I have been keeping company with world-class scholars at a world-class institution. Humility overtakes me as I realize that you all had and have so much to teach me. Morning by morning by morning, we owe you our commitment to the study of life and to lives of study. Morning by morning by morning, we owe you our commitment to the struggle for a just, more merciful world. Morning by morning by morning, we owe you our commitment to the articulation of theologies that are worthwhile. Morning by morning by morning, we owe you our commitment to acts of resistance. Morning by morning by morning, we owe you a debt of love.
we do have about uh, 10 minutes or uh, even shorter time for some questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, let's, let's see, you know, before, uh, you know, I am tempted to, after Joanne's such a powerful uh, and passionate tribute uh, to our uh, professor's uh, work, uh, I'm tempted to ask for their responses. But, uh, you know, before, you know, if so, you, you might get too emo they, they might get too emotional about, about it. <laughs> so uh, they'll, they'll let you get some time to uh, respond and, and give their, you know, share their uh, you know, thoughts. Uh, now, let's see if, if I can get a couple of uh, questions from the uh, audience. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. I just want to say, I don't have a question, but I would just like to make a, a statement. I just want Dow and Susan and Ted to know that what they have imparted into my life and consequently into the lives of all those that my life has touched is immeasurable. You have no idea. And I just want to thank you. in a mood for questions either. There's not a month that goes by that I don't think of one or more of these things. Ted Jennings saying to me in script in a book that he wrote, don't believe everything you read. <laughs> <laughs> Dow Edgerton saying to me, well, you know, there are around here some fictions of enmity or him quoting Andre, um, something to the effect of a dread, which has been bestowed upon me, a dread of being found merely correct. Mm. Mm. And in the undertakings of my life, professional and volunteer, there's not many weeks that pass that I don't think of Susan's powerful hand and heart in my presence on one day when she said, well, you know, Really, you are the president of the student body, <laughs> when I didn't actually have that role. Because she called out in me a kind of awareness of myself and what it means uh, to lead in ways named and unnamed, mm -hmm. and to accept that and the complexity and, and hardness of that. Um, so if um, theological education is not about career, and is instead about vocation. I'm so deeply grateful to you for your abiding presence in my life. Thank you, Joanne, for honoring them and this place so well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Other quick thoughts or comments uh, or even questions? Please. people. Uh, I was a, quite a successful banker, all things considered, <laughs> and uh, decided about three years before I retired, it'd be good to do something else when I did retire. I'm a son of a minister and a grandson of a fairly famous minister. Mm -hmm. uh, and having been wandering in the wilderness of banking for 40 years, I thought I might be able to do something constructive. Getting involved in CTS which, by the way, I did by getting to know Barbara Shibberg, who was a wonderful friend, and a friend of mine and her husband, uh, Bruce. And she was hired by the seminary as a consultant to bring in some business people to the board to try and help them in a, in a period of financial interest and distress and opportunity. But the point I wanted to make very briefly is my life changed forever knowing these people, knowing Dow and Susan and Ted, and Joanne, and William Young, and others. And the way it changed, I thought was so interesting, having been a preacher's son, uh, was that I learned how much I didn't know. When I was chair, I decided to uh, take courses. 
and uh, the learning from those courses, not only from these fine professors, but getting to know for the first time, personally, someone who was gay or transgender as a human being and a friend. And boy, that every day when I came to the seminary, either being as a trustee working with, with the trustees and the board and the faculty, learning from the students, I used to say to myself, there's another prejudice I just lost. Mm. And it was such a blessing to me, and I just have to thank these people who made my life change significantly in terms of who I am and what I try and get done in life. Mm. It is consistent in a way with what I did before, but now it's just so interesting to know people in a different way. And I learned it purely by getting involved with these fine people. So I just want to say thank you. Maybe the last uh, thought from Christian. Um, I want to say thank you. <laughs> um, muchas gracias. I take from, from all of you um, the understanding that theological education has to do with standing at difficult intersections, specifically facilitating processes of formation at the intersectionalities of the church, the academy, and the community. And for that, I, I great, great, I'm grateful, and I honor your commitment and your work and, and your time for all of us as students. Um, I wasn't sure why I came tonight. <laughs> I, I came from Boston. <laughs> and, uh, and there was something. Every time there was an email sent to me. <laughs> so far to go to, to Chicago in the middle of the week, um, you know, at this time of the semester. But I had to come because you continue to help me understand how that commitment to freedom of education, to the space of creativity, to the creating of spaces is so important. And Susan, I serve as faculty of contextual education at Boston University School of Theology. <laughs> so, so all of that that you talked about goes back there somehow <laughs> in some shape or form. And I continue to thank you. Thank you for also modeling tonight as a panel the transition to a more inclusive, ethnically diverse faculty and the amazing uh, processes that you modeled for us. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, for being here. Yeah. I'd like to ask, uh, see if uh, Dao, Susan, Ted, uh, any uh, response, uh, thoughts? We had our shot. You yeah. had your shot. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Time for a break. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, now I'll invite uh, President Hunt to close us off. I think we can, while well, they're doing whatever they're going to do, um, collectively say thank you. It's been our privilege. Thank you. So I, I need the three of you to please come down here. Uh, Ted, you need to stand right here. Susan, you need to stand here. It's the only time Ted's ever going to do what I tell him to do. Dow, you need to stand here. <laughs> Behind here. No, just yours. Dow, here. So. First, I want you to open what's on top, but I need to tell you something. Um, right now, graduate students are really stressed and trying to complete their work, and a graduate student wrapped things on top, but didn't put the name on them. So if you get one that's not for you, you need to give it to someone else. <laughs> Excellent. 
Okay, how lucky is that? I didn't have to say anything. And now, yes, Ted, you may unwrap your chair. <laughs> oh, it has my name on it. Yeah. That one has your name on it. You can all, no, you don't have to wait. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's just. Ted wants a cigarette. That's why I'm moving us along. And yeah, we got whiskey too. We don't make anything easy at CTS. Good thing, good thing. Board cheers to the rescue. Wonderful. You look fabulous. You look fabulous. And now we all want to thank you for your century of teaching. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a good evening.